All right, good afternoon. Oh, wow, that's loud. I only have it on 30%. How is that so loud? All right, good afternoon, everybody. How's it? Get it? Is that a lot better? Everybody can hear me? All right, so what I want to do today, um, we're going to be doing uh, some in-class problems just like uh, usual. We're going to try to do the similar format. I made one minor change just because of some of the issues that have been going on with the student machine. Uh, what I'm going to ask you to do, if you follow the directions on that link, is instead of putting in your Git repo, I want you to create a folder that's at that same level. So if you go into your Dropbox and you create a LEC 10, it should uh, show up at the same level. The TAs have access to it, which will make it a lot easier. You don't need to push, and I think that's going to work better. So that way, there's uh, reduces the confusion of pushing to Git at certain times, depending on who's working on what assignment. The other thing I wanted to say uh, is to give you a little note of encouragement. I think this is, uh, you know, it's a challenging semester. You have my class, you have systems programming, you have logic design, and you're putting in a lot of work. And I noticed it, I know Professor Bowie notices it, and I know Professor Brockton notices it. The reason I mention this is because in about four weeks, you're gonna be starting to work on a, 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 the final project for the course, which I call a pre-turnship. So it's a pre-internship. And the whole idea is that you're gonna work with an, in, you're gonna interview an industry mentor, propose a project, and then work on it for the last four weeks of the semester. So it gives you a really good opportunity to get a foot in the door with certain companies, especially if it's on a type of project that you really enjoy. And so we're gonna have 42 different projects. And so in order to sell uh, some people on wanting to be mentors, I will show them past semester uh, pre-turnships from last semester, but I'll also show them some of the work and some samples from what you're doing this semester. And so what I would like to do is I'm gonna show you uh, three people who have agreed to be pre-turnship mentors in the last couple of days, just kind of give you a pick me up and let you know how it is and what kind of people are recognizing your hard work and how well you all are doing. So the first one uh, is uh, Sam Shilace. Sam Shilace is the Vice President of Engineering for Industrial Par uh, Programs at Google. And he got his start, he worked on a uh, company called Writerly and that got bought out and that became what you know now as Google Docs. So he's the inventor of Google Docs. He also is a co-founder of Box, and now he's at Google as the, one of their VPs. And I was showing several of your projects and he was really impressed with your work and he wants to know more and see uh, what some of you who work on a project with him could bring to Google. So there's gonna be at least four Google projects. In addition, um, okay, so that, but that's, so that's Sam. This uh, second person is uh, William Geistermeyer. I am showing you all the ads from all the websites today. Uh, he used to be a top official at NASA and now he's a vice president at SpaceX. And he does a lot of stuff with uh, software testing and being able to automate it. And I was talking about how I want to enter, how I'm integrating spiral software development into the pre-turnship project. And he really likes what's going on there. So he, uh, you can look up him as well. And then the third one, uh, Matt Francis is the global chief technology officer at IBM. And so those are going to be three of the 42 pre-turnship mentors, and all of them saw work that you've done this semester and were impressed with it and were willing to mentor. And so I just want you to know that not only am I noticing your hard work and your other professors are noticing your hard work, but people see what you're doing this semester and they're really impressed and want to see what you can do in that creative environment. So I just want to encourage you, keep up the good work. And speaking of keeping up the good work, Let's get to doing dynamic, finishing up dynamic arrays, and then we're going to do hash tables. So first, what I want to do is I'm going to go through this animation of what we coded yesterday to show you what's going on with the dynamic array and how they're beneficial and how it ties into this idea of a moratized analysis. So first, we had created some code and we had a couple of dynamic arrays, one of which I used the assignment operator from the first one. So we're combining several concepts here. And so we had a constructor that passed it in a size in. And so what would happen is we'll set the size equal to the size. And in that piece of code, I put in with the constructor to initialize the dynamic array to a size of four. This line constant size in means that if I don't put in a value, the default constructor will put in a zero. 
So if you have that, but you say equals zero, you're simultaneously writing a default constructor and a top and an overloaded constructor. Then we assign capacity to be the same. And then we allocate a new array templated to type T, in this case, integer of four there. So that's how a dynamic array is allocated in memory. Then what happens is we use the array operator. So X of zero is three. X of one is two, X of two, eight, X of three is four. Then I create a new dynamic array and I say Y is gonna be equal to X. So we're gonna call that assignment operator. So we're passing, we're calling by reference the first one. And then we're gonna say, well, if this does not equal the address of assigned. So we see here that they're not pointing to the same location on the data heap. Therefore, we're actually going to copy. So first I will say, all right, I'm gonna assign length equal to assign.length, capacity equals assign.capacity. I allocate the memory. And then, and this is gonna be a response to a question that was asked uh, yesterday. I have this copy method that I presented of which we're gonna pass the pointers to those two arrays and we're gonna iterate through and you're gonna see that I'm gonna, we've copied three, now we've copied two, now we've copied eight, and now we've copied four. And then it goes out of scope, all those extra pointers go away and we just have two this pointers that are pointing to two dynamic arrays. So when we coded up the insert method, what happens is here I have a length of three, I have three elements in there and a capacity of four. So what happens is when our length is less than the capacity, we skip past this if statement, I do some pointer arithmetic, point at that specific location in memory and then write the value and then I increment length. So now length is four and capacity is four. The next thing, is now I'm gonna insert another one. I'm gonna push back a new value 44, but I'm out of room. So here's what's going on. It's kind of the same principle as a dynamic array in that we're going to use pointers to be able to find locations in memory. Now it's gonna be a, a big, bigger thing in operating systems when you learn about something called paging and segmentation. But the, the reason why we have to do it this way is there's no guarantee that the memory that is after the dynamic array is available for us. It could be used by a different object. It could be used by a different program, especially if you're doing parallel processing. So we have to find memory and that's where we have the pointer pointing to the memory here. So what will happen is we check to see if the length is zero, it's not. Then we multiply the capacity by two. So what we're doing is we're now doubling the array. So we have a local, variable that tells us how long the memory we've allocated is. Then that T star temp equals new capacity. What I'm doing is I'm creating a temporary pointer that's pointing to a location in memory. The T casts from void star to whatever the type is to give it context. So now we have a new array and then I'm gonna call copy and we see that it copies all the values over, but we still have four more elements in the dynamic array. Then we have this new line delete with the uh, braces with the array operator and data. What that means is we delete the data that's being pointed to, but we do not delete the pointer itself. So watch what happens. We'll see that the memory goes away, but that int star data that's here still is good, it still exists. So now what's gonna happen when we say data is equal to temp, we're gonna take this pointer and point to where temp is pointing, like so. So now it's pointing to the new location on the data heap we were able to find. Then what's gonna happen, we go out of scope, that temp pointer is gone, and now we have our new dynamic array. Then we do the same thing with data length equals value and length plus plus. All right, so the question is, what, in what order is the arguments for arguments for copy? In the one I have here, it's destination, origin, and the length. So the question is, well, wait a minute, we have to do all these copies. That seems pretty inefficient. I thought you said that this was gonna be an efficient data structure with 
an average big O of one insertion. And this is true. It's on average pushback just performs one addition of, of array arithmetic and puts the value on the data heap. However, we have an occasional worst case scenario. And that is where we apply what we learned yes, uh, on Tuesday about a moratized analysis. So what's gonna happen is most of them are gonna be big O of one, but then we have to make a copy. So it's the current value of N plus one. And so what's gonna happen is this is the actual number of operations it would take to perform a certain number of inserts. So one insert is one, two inserts, I have to copy one, I have to, do, I have to copy two, then do one, three is just three plus one, that's three here, and that's what's going on here. One, two, I get to four, I've run out of room for five, I then have to copy again. So I have five plus copy four plus the insert. At eight, this remains the same. So all of these other inserts were big O of one. Then I had 13 operations, so I have to, I had the 13 operations, I had to copy eight values, and then I'm pushing back that last value. And if I keep going all the way up to 65 inserts, there's a total of 190 operations for 65 inserts. So first, I'll have some charts here. The first chart, I compare it to big O of N versus what I'm gonna call a moratized big O of N. And we see that there are occasional worst case scenarios, but by and large, it has the same slope. So it doesn't look great, but when we compare it to big O of N log N, our approach appears significantly improved. So we have an occasional worst case scenario, but overall, we have a better trade-off. And so that's one of the things about a moratized analysis. And we're gonna see that again when we do hashing sizes today. And then finally, when we compare that all to big O of N squared, it is significantly better. So the dynamic array, it performs those operations for the user. You know, when you're using standard vector, you push back, you don't care about how it works, it just works well. Does anybody have any questions on that before we continue? All right, so delete and free, the difference between delete and free. Delete, a free is a C legacy. When you, it matches with malloc and free. With C++, it was new and delete. Right? So that's, we had uh, gone over that, but I'm happy to answer it again. So that's the, that's the main difference there. So when I, I called it new, because I'm using the C++ syntax, I'm also using delete, which is also the C++ syntax. All right, so the moral of the story, and we're gonna see this over and over again, is not everything is perfectly simple. Sometimes we have a worst case scenario that we have to account for, but with our moratized analysis, we are able to do so. So I have another question. Can you repeat the difference between a moratized big O of N and big O of N? So that's what I, I will repeat uh, what I just said. Sometimes worst, worst case scenario, is that a, big, a moratized big O of N is almost all the time we have big O of N. It was going on the same slopes, but we have an occasional worst case scenario. If we were to plug it in and do advanced recursion relation analysis, which you'll get to in algorithms, you will see that it is in fact big O of N. But for now, what I want you to know is that occasionally you might get a worst case scenario. So Simran did that. Okay, so we have another question. Is the doubling of space somewhat arbitrary? Just enough to have space for a significant number of big O of one pushbacks, but not over allocating the memory. So it really depends on your application. So let's say you're working with SpaceX or NASA. So we got a NASA pre-turnship. You're putting stuff on the Mars rover. The Mars rover C++ code has removed dynamic arrays entirely. They only want to allocate the memory that they're allocating. We can't just send somebody to Mars to reset it if we have a core dump. So it's not necessarily arbitrary. If you're writing it on the Notre Dame machines, it might be arbitrary. It's like, okay, I have a certain number of elements I wanna put in a vector, that's fine. If you, have, if you know the exact number of elements, you can use a static array, allocate the memory. If you use new, you would call it delete later. If you use malloc, you would call free later. If you don't know exactly how many you want, 
but you still need it fast and you have the ability to use that memory, you would use a dynamic array. So I see there's another question being typed up. So please let me know if that, these are addressed your questions. So now we have speed. So do delete data only freeze the memory but does not delete the pointer? Yes, that is exactly right. Just to review, delete array data, freeze the memory that the pointer is pointing to, but not the pointer itself. It doesn't free the register. It's still available to be reallocated. So that's one of the reasons why it's important to understand void pointers because ultimately that T star data, all it does is point somewhere. So when you free the memory, you now know the difference between data and structure. You free that memory, you still have the pointer, but you can reallocate it to point to somewhere else. Any other questions? I do see that somebody's typing. So while, you're, while they're typing, I'm gonna introduce this idea of hash maps. So a hash map kind of came about when we're trying to figure out the amount of, some amount of memory. And I really need things to be done very, very fast. So for example, automotive environments. I, there are several computer chips that are there that are reading in how fast a, objects are coming towards the car with the idea of calculating whether or not we need to deploy an airbag. So the goal is that if you hit, you shouldn't go forward and then get giant amount of whiplash from an airbag, it should meet you in order to help your neck. So we need to be able to process that fast. Financial environments, really fast. The delete, how does the delete know where the memory to be freed is? That is because it is pointing at the same place where int star data is pointing. That's how it knows. All right, next question. When we delete memory, does that T star temp, is it pointing to null temporarily? Yes, we update it. Well, actually, that's not true. It's still pointing at the location. We just don't have any memory. So it's like, remember when we did void star, uh, we allocated the memory for hello, we had another void star reference and it was just pointing to a location. What we do is we now put in zero X zero. So it is pointing to null, but we can update it to point to somewhere else. All right. So I'm gonna start making, I see there's more questions coming, but I'm gonna start to progress on that and I'll address them uh, um, at the earliest convenience. So the hash table, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna disassociate the idea of the location of the array, and I'm gonna use a key that can be of any deterministic type, and I'm gonna go into more detail with what I mean by deterministic in a moment. And that translates to a location in a dynamic array of whatever value I'm gonna use. So a hash table is going to have two generic types. When we delete memory, okay, I'm sorry, it's, it's, the, it's the same question. And it's also known as an associative array because we associate a specific type of key with a specific type of value. So one important thing to bear in mind before we go too much further into the design is that these are not stored consecutively. Everything you've studied up to this point, arrays, dynamic arrays, singly linked lists, doubly linked lists, stacks, queues, there is some sort of logical ordering. One thing begins, I can iterate and I go to the end. This is not the case with hash tables. With hash tables, you can, let's say I store 10 elements, I can iterate zero through nine and use that key to look things up, but they're not gonna be in that same order. The hash function distributes it. We're gonna see more details about what I'm saying in a moment. But the whole idea is I can put in two different keys and they can come up to two very different locations. However, because I'm using a hash function, regardless of where the element is, I can look it up in big O one of time. Whereas if I wanted to see, is there an element in an array? Is there an element in a dynamic array? Is there an element in a list or a stack or a queue or a priority queue? I would in the worst case scenario have to look up all n elements. And on the average, I'd have to look up n over two, which is one half times n. And we learned in big O notation that C times G of n is that scenario. So it becomes big O of n every single time. The purpose of a hash table is to be able to find things in big O one of time. 
And the trade-off is memory. And so that gets back to that question that was asked a little earlier about memory. So we have to consider speed versus memory. This is a big thing that you're gonna be working a lot in your careers. Okay, this gets really, really fast. Oh, what's, what's, the, what's the catch? Oh, the catch is it takes up a lot of memory. Well, I have all the memory in the world. Okay, no big deal. Oh, we're extremely limited. Well, then that might not be the best solution. Right. Does anybody have any questions about this before I, go, before I continue? Okay, so the question is, how does it know how much memory to free? That is an operating system, some operating systems problem. The operating system contains all of that information. So we tell it new, and that's stored. When I say free, it goes in, that pointer is kept in that memory map trace. And then it goes there and says, oh, that's how much memory, and it frees it. But then when I out reallocate it, it updates it again with the operating system. Okay, did that address your question, Alex? All right, so I'll come back in a moment to see. So a crucial thing, ah, good job. All right, thank you. Um, glad to hear it, answer your question. The crucial thing, I'm gonna show you an example of code here in the moment, is that the key must be in some way, shape, or form translated into a deterministic result. And here is what I mean by that. If I have the value 10 as an integer, and I divide by 10, it will be one, right? Or if I do 10 mod seven, that will be three. That is some sort of, it will always be three. That works for ints, it works for um, unsigned int, long unsigned int. It even works for characters because characters are ASCII values. They're actually eight bit unsigned integers. So I can use characters, which means if I have a length, of some sort of array, I can use that. So a string, if I know the length of the string, I can use that as my hash function. And we're gonna do that in code today. But the thing that we can't do, we can't use non-deterministic values, floats, doubles. Those are known as precision. Float stands for single precision floating point. Double stands for double precision floating point. And so in computing, there's a difference between precision and accuracy. In a float or a double, it is very, 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 very close to that value, but not necessarily that value. Does that make sense? I'm gonna show you an example of what I mean in a moment. Right? So it has to be deterministic. The hash function goes to the uh, memory location. So I have some code here on the left. I have a double that's equal to 1.2, and then I subtract 0.1 from it. So we know in our minds that 1.2 minus 0.1 is 1.1. So then I have some code here. If the double equals 1.1, print out true, and then print the result. So we would expect it to print true and 1.1. And so a lot of students who are a lot of new programmers are shocked when they run something like this and it returns false. Like, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. It's 1.1, I compared it to 1.1, that's clearly true. This is the difference between accuracy and precision. And the way I could find this out is if I put the library limits here, and then I actually can do standard C out dot precision. Standard C out is a library. I can actually call methods on it. So this is another way in which we can treat things like objects. So I put the precision and now I'm printing it to 17 decimal places. Once I go to 17 decimal places, what you'll see is it's not actually 1.1, but it's actually 1.09999 and it keeps going on. It is very precise. It is almost 1.1, but it's not 1.1. And this is an important thing to bear in mind in hash tables. Another thing, remember in lab three when I coded up a money class? When I coded up that money class, I had deterministic long unsigned int, I'm sorry, long signed int, and then integers. They are, I'm sorry, they are accurate, not precise. So if I'm trying to compare, if you say, how much money does this person have? And you have some sort of comparison, and that doesn't work, that can cause very serious financial issues. 
So that's why money is often written up as a class object with dollars and cents separate than using floating points or doubles. Right? Does anybody have any questions about that? So for those of you who are taking logic design, you'll learn the mechanisms of IEEE 754 format and precisely why that happens. But for now, just know that we have to have some sort of accurate, 100% reliable way of translating. So it has to be deterministic and it has to map to a fixed number of locations. So what's gonna happen is a hash table is gonna use a dynamic array. We can keep adding elements in, and then when we reach a certain point, we're going to what's known as rehash, and we can get the rest of the dynamic array. So what I have here is the fundamental method for hashing. We're going to eventually, there's going to eventually be more complicated, but basically you'd have some sort of deterministic value that we can mod with the number of elements in that dynamic array. Those elements in the dynamic array, you're often going to hear them referred to as buckets. And in coding challenge five, you're actually going to write a program for something called bucket sort. You're going to use buckets to sort elements fast. So let's say I had some sort of function, excuse me, uh, if I'm putting in 13, it's going to be 13. And then let's say I have seven buckets, 13 mod seven will give me six. So I want to go to the sixth location in the array. Does that make sense? So that's the key to value. So the array we've learned about standard vector, just like the dynamic array that we built in the last lecture. And now what we can do is we can aggregate off of that to be able to build our hash table. So we aggregating off of a static array that we've allocated using the new keyword into the dynamic array where we're abstracting complexity of reallocating the memory away from the user. And then we're gonna aggregate even further with a hash table where we're using the hash function as an input, which then determines whether or not we need to reallocate memory at certain locations, which then goes into the static array, which then goes into void pointers. And so the whole thing is we are, as we go further and further out, we are reusing work just like you did when you build your priority queue in coding challenge four. You're re reusing the work of the uh, doubly linked list to build the priority queue. Same thing with the hash table. So the key can be deterministic and the array can be any type that we can store an array as long as it's homogeneous. And so the first thing I wanna show you in the code that you've downloaded let me quick connect here and then get in there. In, you have it in lecture code. I have this test file. So in the include, in this linear probe 1.h, all I have here is the private vec member, which is a vector that has been templated to value. I have templated my hash table to key and value here. I have a constructor, which just like before has cons unsigned int size. And here I'm just using the constructor for vectors to make a vector of that size. And then I have a friend operator and all the friend operator does as of right now is just prints out the size to the user. And so in a linear probe LP test one, what I have done to test to make sure that works is I've created two hash tables, one with the key of string and the value is unsigned int. And the second is key is int and the value is double. So standard string has a fixed length that I can compare if it's, if noter is always gonna be five, game will always be four. Double can be a value because I can store it in an array. And so what's gonna happen when I print these two out is it's gonna print the size. So here, I, for this hash, I set it to seven. And then here I call the default constructor. And since I'm not passing anything to it, C++ will overwrite it because I said const unsigned int size equals zero. So it's gonna print out, it's gonna print out seven and zero. And that's exactly what happened. Does anybody have any questions on this so far?
All right, so the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna take step by step into developing a hash function. So this is gonna be the first portion of your code that you're gonna write. And I'm gonna warn you that what we're gonna do in linear probe 2.h is actually gonna produce wrong answers. And that I want those wrong answers to provoke questions. What's happening and why? And what's gonna motivate the rest of what we're gonna do when we work with hash functions? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna insert an element, we're gonna look up an element, and then we're gonna delete the element when we no longer need it. We're gonna talk about hash deletion later. So we somehow need to determine the location. So we need to actually write a hash function. So in this case, we're gonna need a hash function for every single type because we can't just template it. We actually need to know the type inside. So an int is gonna have something, a string is gonna have something else. And that's how the C++ standard template library works. It has a lot of private methods that have underlying hash functions. So you can just template it to whatever you want. So let's see how this works. So in order to do this, we go to insert the key and return something that we're gonna to pass to a location. So first we're gonna write a hash function. Okay, I just said all of this. Okay, size function, I've said this again, it returns a long unsigned int, which is we, we can use as deterministic. All right, so what I want you to do is I want you to go to uh, the include folder and go to linear probe 2.h and open that and then go to line 13. You'll see a comment there that says that this is where problem one begins. And to give you a preview while you're doing that, what we're gonna do is we are going to write two hash functions, one for an integer, one for a string. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna write a private find position, we're gonna write find position method that allows us to be able to hash the function. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna do, we're gonna write this together. We're gonna, it's gonna be a private method and it's gonna be a hash function. So let me bring this up, do the same thing you all just did, go to include linear probe two. And you should see problem one starts here. And so the first thing we're gonna say is we're gonna write our hash function for an int. So we're gonna say long unsigned int is gonna be what we return because long unsigned int is what we use to actually represent memory location. So if we return long unsigned int, it allows us to correlate with memory. And I'm gonna call this hash func. And I'm gonna pass const int call by reference, and I'm gonna say key to translate. And the method needs to be const as well. And so if key to translate, if it's less than zero, so if it goes somehow goes negative, then I'm gonna say, give me negative one times that, and then we're gonna cast to long unsigned int. So I'm gonna say return. So the way it would work, I would cast a long unsigned int, and it will be negative one times the key to translate. So now we've trained it to positive, and now we've added 64 bits and made it a long unsigned integer. Otherwise, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna return key to translate casted to a long unsigned int. So what I'm gonna to do to make it simple, I will remove this negative one here. And that is what we want to do for an integer. The second one we're gonna write is we're gonna write the same thing. It's gonna be called long unsigned int hash func, except instead of passing an integer, you'll see that we're going to pass a string, right? So if what I want you to do is up at line five, we do pound include string like so. And then what we're gonna do, 
we're going to do const standard string called by reference key to translate and const. So it's going to be the same thing here, except instead of constant, we're going to say standard string. And then we would put a bracket there to close everything off. So now we know that a standard string's size is a long unsigned int. That's what, if you look up at CPP reference, that's actually what it says. So this makes life simple for us. We can just return key to translate dot size. Does everybody see how we're doing this? You can define hash functions for different types. And so what we're doing here with this hash function is we're taking any type and then translating it into a deterministic way into a long unsigned integer. And that long unsigned integer is how we can then correlate to the location in the array. Does anybody have any questions before I go on to the third part? All right, so. The third part, we're now going to write a Beth function called find position. And we're going to call this long unsigned in as well. And we'll call this find POS for find position. And then this is going to bring in const key call by reference. I'm going to call it the key. And we'll do const. And here's what we're going to return. So now, I, this can be any type. And so if I have defined a hash function, I would just say we're going to return. If I return the hash function for that type, it will work. It'll say hash function. And I'll say the key. And so that gives me the long unsigned int. And then I want to mod it by the number of buckets. And that gives me my full hash function. So it's going to be mod, and the private member is array dot size. So there's all three things that you need to write for problem one. The first one, we're doing a, we're translating an integer to a long unsigned int. The second, we're taking a string, and we're getting a deterministic result to also translate it to a long unsigned int. And the third one, we're taking that translated result we're then performing mod, and that find position then translates to a location in the underlying array. So that is the fundamental of how a hash function works. Yes? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Is there something about the size of the string? Yes, because absolutely. So the question is, can I pass both the int and the string? So what's going to happen is I templated the key. They say the key is int. That will then template to int and call the int version. If I template the key to standard string, it will template the standard string, which then will call the standard strings version. So we're combining function overloading, templating, and generacy. Did that address your question? All right, excellent. Any other questions? All right, let me check the Slack as well. Uh, we have. Uh, we have to, why do we have to change from int to long unsigned int? That's memory. Um, can you explain again what mod is doing? If I do, if I did 13 divided by seven, we know that's gonna be one with the remainder of six. So 13 mod seven is gonna be equal to six. And this is beneficial because I can do uh, six mod seven gives me six, 13 mod seven, 18 mod seven gives me six and so on. So this will be something that we'll revisit over and over again. And this allows us to have a wide variety of potential inputs and then map it to a specific location. All right, so I'm gonna update the code, make sure we did everything right. And if it works, you can run LP test two and it's gonna run and we have a hash size and then, uh-oh, what's that? Floating point exception error core dump. Does anyone, before I go into the next slide, does anybody have any theories as to what might have happened?
I'm sorry, I heard somebody. Give it a try. I'm not going to judge you for being wrong. I'll give you a hint. What's the original size of the vector when we did this? Yes, zero. So this gets back to Selena's question. What's going on with mod? Well, it turns out when we call mod and we do five mod zero, it returns infinity. So therefore, in the second hash, when I was trying to put it in there, there's nothing there. So here, there's insert. Okay, so first I call the insert key value long unsigned int location is find position. And then I go to array location and that equals the value. And so that's what we have so far. Okay, so I call the operator. This was the, we see that int hash was empty. And I call it, and as we ex saw, we expected this. Now, first thing before we continue, um, do ls. You should see prob1.txt if your code worked. And so what's happening is we have another problem. I put in three values in main, but there's only two values in the hash. So what happened is there are two values that hash to the same location. So let me show you LP test two. In this case, I have a standard string. And we see I have data structures and hash, where data is the key, 22 is the value. Then I call structures, and then I call hash. And if I look at my result, you'll see 3 and 15. 15 was the value for structures. And if we look at the other one, we see 4 and 9. 9 was the value for hash. So I hashed. I put in data, and then I hash structures using the same function, and then it overrode it. So I've lost the integrity of my data. So, not all, so in one case, I didn't uh, have that problem because I initialized the size of the hash, but it still gave me wrong value. In the other case, we actually solved it, but the problem is it had mod zero. In that case, it was infinity, and we get a floating point exception error. So now let's see if we can figure out what it is that we can do to fix this problem. The first problem is what I have called, what we will call a collision. We have two hash function values going to the same location. I showed you an example when I did six mod seven, 13 mod seven, 18 mod seven, they all go to location six. So the question is, how would I be able to determine which one is which? Okay, so there's double infinity. So we need a non-zero size. So here's an issue. Now we're going back to a moratized analysis. For those of you who are taking logic design and computer architecture, you're now you might be familiar with the idea that memory is allocated in bytes, byte addressing. So we saw that when we alloc went through and iterated, we saw that in the hexadecimal, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 was actually 8-bit chunks, just like characters. And so sometimes if you're trying to hash and keep track of memory, the values that we're going to uh, hash are actually all multiples of each other. They're all multiples of 8. And so therefore, you actually would increase the possibility that you all have collisions, which is not good. So the question is, how should I size the hash table to reduce this? How can I take advantage of an amortized situation where I don't get ideal inputs? Is it, does anybody have any idea? Like, if I wanted to distribute, if I have things that are multiples of each other and I want to have them distributed anyway, what type of number would I want to make my size? 
I'll give you a hint. I, it would allow me to remove multiples entirely. What's the time? For, yes. Very good. We're going to make them prime numbers. So any prime number greater than one. So we don't get any benefit if the keys are evenly distributed, but in many applic applications, they won't be. So this will allow us to be able to account for worst case scenarios. So we don't get any benefit, but it's no de degradation if we make it a prime number. But if we have an, in, uh, a non-ideal situation, it truly benefits us. And so in linear probe 3.h, these are two functions that are there. I've included them. Uh, you're welcome to look at them if you want. It's just mathematical. But basically what it does is I call is prime that checks to see if a number that we're passing for a size is a prime number. And then we have another function, next prime, that gets the next largest prime number after that value. So I check to see if it's a prime number. If not, we just go get it. So now in linear probe 3.h, I can run this and we'll see that make LP test three. And now we've cleared up the second problem. We've gotten rid of that mod zero. So now we say, well, what's the next uh, prime number greater than zero? It becomes one. What's the next prime number greater than one? Three, and it goes on. So it goes five, seven, and then uh, goes on to 11, 13, and so forth. But it still hasn't clarified our collision problem. So we need to figure out a way to resolve collisions. And so there are several ways of doing this that we're going to learn about in this course. And the one we're going to learn about today is known as linear probing. And so what we're going to do is we're going to, in our code, design a private struct that keeps track of the key and the value. So that way, when I look at that location in the array, what this will allow me to do is to say, all right, I've hashed to this key, then I'm going to check the, va the value to see if that value is what I actually want or what I've actually stored. So this will allow us to not only put things in faster and correlate them, but also when we do find and eventually delete operations, it will make it much easier for us to do this as well. Okay, so, um, hold on, there we go. So what I would like you to do is I'd like you to go to include linear probe 4.h and then go to line 13. And we're going to solve this problem together. So you'll see at line 13, it says problem two goes here. And it's right above the is prime and next prime if you'd like to study those as well. So what we're going to do is we're going to write a private struct that we, it's going to contain a key and a value. And we're going to write two constructors. And then we're going to write an array, a dynamic array that templates to that struct. So we're going to call that struct hash entry. And what's the rule? If it's a struct or a class in C++, what do I need to do at the end of that, of every single one? Yes. Semicolon. Very good. We got to put a semicolon right here. So structs, their members are by default public, so we don't have to write the private keyword. And in fact, this makes it easier to code. So we're going to say key, the key, and we're going to say value, element. Now, once you're, going to, once you're done with that, we're going to look at two constructors. Hash entry is going to be a default constructor. And we're going to write a member initialization list, key, comma, el, I'm sorry, the key, comma, element. And then we use the brackets there at the end because that's a procedure because C and C++ are procedural languages and that performs the operation for us. So that's required. So now for the overloaded constructor, we're just going to bring in what is known as a standard pair. A 
And so I want to go back to the slide real quick. Standard pair is a member of the C++ standard template library that has just a pair of elements. And we can, can template them to whatever we want. They're very useful in key and value. When you go into Coding Challenge 5, I go into much more detail about standard pair, and I show you example about how standard pair can be used to solve the quadratic formula. Because quadratic formula has a plus and minus result. So we can't just return a double because we have two answers that we need. If we return a standard pair, then we can actually do this. So standard pair is just like a hash function in that we can template it to two different things. And so here we're going to say standard pair, and we're going to template, and now I'm going to say const key. This is something that's useful in C++ in that when you say const key, you can't have somebody try to get tricky and change the type. So we're going to say it's always const key, so that way we don't lose the integrity of finding the elements. And then we'll just say value. And so let me zoom out just a little. And I'll say the pair. And that's our member initialization list. And I can press, actually I'll press enter and go like that. And here's how you access elements in a standard pair. So key will say the pair, and the first element is accessed with dot first. And we say element, and what do you think I'm going to put here? Yes, the pair dot second, very good. The const contains only to the key. Uh, so that was a question in the Slack. So with the pair dot second, I'll spell second correctly, and then we'll put those braces. And so now we've written our fundamental struct for this hash table. So now below that, we're going to have our private member that correlates with it. We're going to do standard vector. And then instead of having a vector of key, we're going to have a hat vector of hash entry. And I'm going to call that array. Does anybody have any questions about that so far? All right, so if we save this, this is problem two. Everything else works. Let me bring this back up. So when we call insert, we're going to pass a standard pair. I'm going to find the position by passing insert pair dot first. And then because array location is a hash entry, I can say array location dot key is insert pair dot first, and array location value is insert pair dot second. So now in the array operator, what I'm going to do is I'm iterating through, I'm going to print out the keys and the values. And then what I'd like to show you next is lptest4.cpp. And then here what I have is I have standard string as a hash size, second one's int and double, I hash data structures and hash, and I print it out, and so that's going to print out all the values, and then in hash insert, and then I'm going to print those values out. And so in order to do this, you do make LP test four. And what did I do wrong here? Okay, it does not have any field called key. I screwed up. At line 22, it should be called the key. So let me go back here. and then element matches. So they're at line 22. And so that's likely what caused all of those other errors. Nope, not quite right. What else did I do wrong? Key and value. Oh, you know what? Did I read that wrong? I did, I'm so sorry. 
just key, key, I apologize for this, and key. I'll give you a split second to fix it. That's my fault. Because everything else is just key, so key and element. And so when you fix that, it will compile correctly. And so lowercase t will do it. Yeah, so Matthew, you pointed it out. Uh, we aren't, we, why aren't we calling the pair by reference? That's another good observation. Call it by reference here in the constructor. All right, so everybody give me a thumbs up when you've corrected Dr. Morrison's mistake in your own code. Okay, see a lot of thumbs up, very good. Shouldn't the element, though this, this I have throughout the code as element, not, not value, that's, that's correct. So let me update that and double check to make sure I didn't make any other mistakes. And there we almost have, doesn't have a member called value. Am I losing my mind? Ew, nope, uh, Elijah, you have caught it as well. So it's just the value. Sorry, I have. Let me check that and then I'll leave it up again so everybody can fix. There we go, now it's compiling. All right, let me get this out of the way real quick. Here is the correct result, key and value. And so what I wanna show you when it comes back up is that I'm printing the values and that we have hash tables that are all of a size of prime numbers. And so let me, I'll put that in the chat so that way if you wanna access it later. Also, for those of you in the chat, if you would be so kind as to ask questions in, here I have this little spiel, but if you would be so kind, because that can be pretty hard to keep track of all of them. All right, so does everybody have this up now? Okay, so what I wanna show you is here, I still haven't resolved my collision, but now I've set myself up. I have a size of seven there in that hash. So if I bring it up here, I'll run clear and make clean make LP test four, and it compiles. And now we have key and values. I can see that it was structures and I can see it was hash. So our next step for the hash table is to resolve collisions. Also, once you've done that, if you do LS, you'll see problem one dot text and problem two dot text. So now we're gonna resolve collisions. And so what I wanna do is I wanna walk you through the steps of how we would do this. And so the whole idea of linear probing is that when we have a collision, and in this case, I have eight in there, and I wanna hash 15. So 15 mod seven is one, eight mod seven is one, we have a collision. So what's gonna do is it's then going to add one to a private copy and then look to the next location. So if our hash table is big enough, we will reduce the number of collisions. So the size of the hash table should be designed based on your anticipated number of values so you can reduce those collisions as much as possible. So I would go to the next one and we see that 15 is there. So if I'm looking for 15, all I would do is say, all right, there's that, I'll move one down, and if I go one by one, it's linear, hence the name linear probing. And so what I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna show you a couple examples of linear probing and how this has worked. So what's gonna happen is each time I'm gonna maintain the value so that way I make sure that it hashes correctly. And then I have a step size and every time I have a collision, I'm gonna increment I by one. 
So we're going to write this code a little later. And we're also going to work through a couple of examples, including something you like something that you'd be similar that you would see on an exam. And then after that, we'll mod by the table size, which we now know is the size of the standard vector. So let's say I have these values 76, 93, 40, 47, and 10 and 55 with a step size of one. So what will happen is 76 mod seven is six. 93 mod seven is going to be two. So, so far we're good. 40 mod seven is going to be five. So we're able to hash it there. 47 mod seven is five and that's not free. So what would happen is we'd add one. Five plus one becomes six. Six mod seven is six and we don't have that either. Seven plus one becomes, I mean, six plus one becomes seven, seven mod seven is zero. So therefore we are going to put it there. And so the goal is we want to make the hash table big enough eventually such that we can avoid these collisions and only have to do at most three uh, linear probes Therefore, we can maintain that big O of one insert and find. And so if I wanna do 10, 10 mod, uh, 10 mod seven is three and it will be there. 55 mod seven is six, six plus one is seven, seven mod seven is zero, seven plus one is eight. And so 55 goes there. Does that make sense? Okay, so eventually what we're gonna do is in linear probe five, we're gonna actually write our own linear probe. Um, and so what I want you to do there is I want you to go to linear probe five and go to line 87. Not that's linear probe test. And at line 87, you will see problem three starts here. And so we're gonna have three variables that will keep track of all these values. So we're gonna say long unsigned in, and I'm gonna say current position. The next one will be long unsigned int, and that's gonna be my iterator, and I'm gonna set it equal initially to zero, and I'm gonna say long unsigned int I'm gonna make this all caps step size is equal to one. So that's gonna be our step size as we iterate through and find the next position. The next thing I wanna do is, because I have a question in the chat, when the size of the hash table increases, do you have to place all the values again? That's an astute observation and we're gonna be going over that after we write this operation. So what happens when we have too many and when do we decide that we're gonna do what is known as rehashing? So we are gonna do a do while loop. I wanna do this the first time because the first time I always wanna try no matter what to insert. So we're gonna do do and then while like so. And then after a do while loop, you do semicolon. So inside what we're gonna do is we're going to call our hash function and we're gonna update the value of current position. So current position it's gonna be equal to hash function. And you see that I'm bringing in insert pair, which is a standard pair. And I'm gonna call insert pair dot first. Right? And I'm gonna say plus iter times step size. So what happens if, if iter is zero, it'll go to the bucket it automatically tries to go to. But the moment we get that, we would increment it by one, then two, then three. And so now what I would do is I would say, well, I can do enter and tab. And we're gonna divide it by the, the number of buckets, which is actually array dot capacity. We can do array dot size or actually array dot capacity is an important point because that's the 
number of elements that are in the dynamic array, not the, no, I'm sorry, the number of the size of it. So that's the number of elements I could hold, just like we did in dynamic array, as opposed to the size, which is the number of filled elements. So if I were to zoom out, it would look like this. And so we're going to do that. And then we're going to have, for now, three conditions. We're going to say the array at the current position state is empty. And so what I've done here, before we type anything else, I want to show you what I have in the next slide, which is a modification of the hash table. I have now created an enumerated type entry state. Down to have. Uh, Okay, so this is, so what I've done is I've created an enumerated type entry state that tells me whether or not that particular bucket has a value or it's empty. So we can tell the difference. So at the top, I've created the enumerated type. And what enumerated type is, is it uses the keywords active and empty, but this is actually replaced with zero and one. So we're actually treating it like it's binary. So a question is, shouldn't the curly brackets after while be normal? Uh, no, you need the semicolon there in a do while loop. And we're gonna go into more detail in that in a moment. So I'm not, I'm not quite done writing the code. All right, so I want you to go back. To, so you're still here at the do. Now inside the while loop, here's what we're gonna write. First, we're going to say array dot at, and this is going to be the current position dot state. So it's either active or empty. And we're going to keep going while it's not empty. So if we find an empty bucket, we're just going to put it in there. And so the default constructor now fills the entire vector with empty values. So next line, you're going to say and, so now we're going to evaluate the value at the current position with the key, dot key does not equal insert pair dot first. So in this case, what we're doing is we're checking to see, we're checking to make sure that we haven't actually come across a non-empty bucket that already contains the key that we're looking for. And then we have one other case. I'm going to say, and iter does not is less than array.capacity. So now we have stopped to ensure we don't keep going and going and going forever. So we have a valid stopping point. So after the do while loop, we have an if condition that we need to include that indicates whether or not we've actually found it. So if, so at some point we're going to stop this do while loop. And it says say, if the array at current position dot state is not empty. So now we're going to compare this. So let me scroll down just a little. I'm, uh, my apologies. I was just trying. Uh, if we're going to say if it's equal to active and the current position's key is not equal to first, so what this means is if it's if its state is active and It's not equal to that location. That means we need to return array.capacity. So I'm going to explain what I'm doing here. I have some code in the insert method that says if I've returned the array's capacity, we didn't find it. Okay, does that make sense? And so if we get past here, the last thing we're going to do is we're going to return current position, which is where we're going to actually go. So if you don't mind, I'm going to quickly compile to make sure that I did not make any mistakes. 
Okay, I did. At line 94, I have one too many parentheses. And that's likely the source of my other errors. All right. Um, so you have do, while, and that should be parentheses. Like so. And now it compiles. Okay, so we use active and array at current position. T is not first, array dot capacity, otherwise I just return current position. Oh yeah, so the last thing, I apologize. I, you have to actually increment iter. So we're incrementing, now each time we're gonna go by one. So let me quickly do that and then we are going to, and that code works. And so now we see that structures, data and hash are successfully in the hash table and that will work. And if you do LS, you'll see that problem three is there. So here's the write-up. I'm going to uh, leave that up there as I'm kind of uh, rambling on for a moment. What we're going to do for problems four and five is you're actually going to go through and work on trying to do a linear probing problem where you're giving four values and then you're going to try to add, uh, hash them into the hash. I see there's some typing in the, oh, so there's no more typing. All right, does, um, so I'll go over again. Current position, iter equals zero, step size. Current position is set to hash function, iter first plus iter step size. That's all in parentheses, mod array capacity. And then we increment here, while array at current position state is not empty. Array at current position key is not is the first pair and array iter is less than array capacity. And then if, Current position is state is active and current position key does not equal first. We get the array capacity, otherwise we return the current position. All right, does anybody want this up for another moment? All right. While you're doing that, the, what I want you to do is run make problem four and then make problem five and work on that problem. So let me bring this up for a second so that way I can show everybody what I want you to do. And once you do these two problems, oh, um, wait a sec. <laughs> okay, never mind. All right, when you have I'll work through these together with you. So we'll do make problem four. What happened to the code I was writing? All right, so yeah, that's, that's what I got. I got fixed it. All right, so does anybody have, let me bring this code up. Does anybody have any questions about what we've done so far? What we're gonna cover in next lecture is the idea of rehashing, and I'll leave this up there for a minute so you all can continue typing. If you have problems one, two, and three, you'll get full credit for in-class assignment. Does anybody have any questions about the way in which we've constructed the struct to have key value and state, as well as how we use linear, linear probing to resolve collisions? Does anybody have any questions about that? So once you're done having problems one, two, and three, it's 15 seconds away from two o'clock. So what we'll do is we'll finish up hash tables on Tuesday. We'll do some uh, um, advanced memoization. And then on Thursday, we're gonna do a full out exam review because the exam will be a week from this coming Tuesday. All right, so if you have no other questions, uh, you are free to go and uh, I will see you next week. Keep up the good work.